Most people should be aware that there are only two sexes, male marked by XY chromosomes and female marked by XX chromosomes. Now, there are a lot of other combinations of chromosomes possible, so let me add in my transphobia is bad disclaimer. The reason sex and gender are different is because gender is a social construct, like language or money, and like those, it's very important because they separate humans from animals. We've been studying the way that humans differ from animals for, for well, as long as we have been different from them. That study is very important, but it isn't what we're talking about right now. So, with all due respect, this is biology, boy! We dehumanize in this male-female. Take your sensitive areas back to anthropology! Woo! Let's start with a quick intro to sex. A human cell has 23 pairs of chromosomes for 46 total chromosomes. The exact number 23 doesn't matter, so I'll we'll simplify it to the manageable 5 regular chromosomes and the sex chromosomes. These cells become gametes, the sperm and egg, via meiosis. In meiosis, the 46 is doubled into 92 chromosomes, and each pair alternates the genetic material. This is called crossing over or recombination. Then the 92 break into 2 cells with 46. Each of those cells with 46 go on to break into cells with 23, with one of each chromosome. To be a complete human, you need two of each chromosome, so the gamete has to meet another gamete, specifically one of the opposite type. The two types are the egg cell, which has all the amenities you need to become a brand new organism, the only thing it's missing is half of its chromosomes, and the sperm cell, which only has the other half, a motor to get it where it's going, and maybe a tool to help it break into the egg. If your gonads, or sex organs, produce eggs, you're a female. If your gonads produce sperm, you're a male. When you first develop from the meeting of two gametes, you have regular basic gonads. Your X chromosomes will develop those into advanced gonads, and your Y chromosome, if you have one, will turn them into testes. Sex glands have a lot of other effects, but a lot of other things also have those effects, so we focus on the gametes. So humans, like all other mammals, only have two sexes, but that wasn't the question. The question was, how many sexes are there? In humans, ovaries can be thought of as the default, and testes are an augmentation added by an alternate chromosome, hence the name XY sex determination system. In other animals, it can be different. Birds have a ZW sex determination system, where again there's a default and an augmentation, but in birds, males are the default, and females are an augmentation added on by the W chromosome. Now, these systems both hinge on the idea that there's one default and one augmentation, but in flies and frogs, they have homomorphic sex chromosomes. The genetic information for determining sex is scattered throughout the entire genome and can't be determined at a glance. Butterflies are similarly ZW, except the females have an empty space instead of a unique chromosome called ZZZO. Grasshoppers and some other animals have XXXO. Wait, you can have an absence of a chromosome as a genotype? Said the Hymenoptera. Why don't we do that for all of the chromosomes? This is called haplodiploidy. The queen and all females have two chromosomes on every pair, but the male only has one. Since the number of chromosomes is now what determines sex, the sex chromosomes aren't really sex chromosomes anymore. This system is advantageous for a number of reasons. During reproduction, a female can only pass on up to 50% of her genome at a time, but a male can pass on 100%. This devaluing of female reproduction is what led to the emergence of a queen. Let's say you're a female wasp. If you personally reproduce with a male, you will pass on 50% of your genome. But if you have a sister, look at this. When your mother undergoes meiosis, the egg cells that will become you have 50% of her genome, and the egg cells that will become your sister also have 50%, but a different 50%. You can expect an average overlap of 50%. Your haploid brothers will only share that much, but your father is where things get interesting. You see, he only has one chromosome. Chromosome, and if he splits it in half, you wouldn't have the genome you need. So your father gives you 100% of his genome, and he gives the exact same to your sister. The overlap is 100%, which becomes 50% of your DNA. Add that to the 25% of your maternal DNA, and you share 75% of your DNA with your sister. Just to clarify, that DNA percentage means that helping your mother produce sisters is evolutionarily selected for over having your own children, among other benefits like the queen focusing entirely on reproduction and the workers repurposing their reproductive system as a stinger. And that's why it's called the birds and the bees. That 75% is 
very enticing, which is why a lot of insects and insect-adjacent animals are making progress towards evolving it. They're reproductively haploid, but not genetically. What does that mean? Well, check this out. You are a male springtail, which is the closest thing you can get to a bug without being a bug. You go through your life with a normal diploid genome. Your genotype is XO. Actually, you have a second set of sex chromosomes, but the point is you only have one of each. When it's time to reproduce, things get interesting. Normally, in meiosis, you split your chromosomes and each half gets a shot at reproducing, but the springtails throw out the other half, and they, they don't have crossing over, so they don't just purge a random half. They throw out specifically their father's genome. This is good for the female because a grandmother passes on 50% of her genome to a grandchildren rather than the usual 25%. Now, this elimination doesn't actually have to occur in spermatogenesis, it can occur wherever. Now, you may be wondering, if the female's genome is the only one passed on, then the only possible genotype should be XXXX. How then do males continue to exist? Well, the sex chromosomes don't determine sex, they're determined by sex. So, what determines sex? Excellent question. The answer is unsatisfying to say the least. Springtails are poorly studied, and we don't know what precisely causes the two extra X chromosomes to be dropped out, but we do know it's not on the chromosomes. Dalai et al.'s numerous studies have confirmed that much, but Sanchez's 2014 meta-analysis drew a parallel to the significantly more studied Sciaridae, a family of gnats. One of them has a very interesting process of determination, monogenicity. Basically, there's a specific gene on the X chromosome that determines whether a given female will produce male or female eggs. Note that this gene controls the mother, not the offspring. A purple female produces only male, and a blue female produces only females. Did you get all that? When an outside process controls sex, it's called environmental sex determination. Crocodiles and some turtles have something similar. Like wasps and bees, they have no sex chromosomes, they have regular chromosomes. Sex is then controlled based on the temperature. Some of the gnats are also dependent on temperature. This is what allows clownfish and a lot of other fish to switch sexes when the dominant female dies. The gene allowing females, or disallowing males, switches on when the need is present to be a female. Now, you probably have a lot of questions by now, the biggest one being, would you still love me if I was a worm? Now, we use the word worm to refer to a lot of different organisms, but I'll assume you're talking about a penis worm because they also have to do with love or sex. Penis worms are also called Priapulida, named after Priapus, Greek god of erections. He was the son of Aphrodite. You know who else was? Hermaphrodite. Penis worms aren't hermaphrodites, but you know who is? Regular worms. It all comes full circle, just like a worm! <gasps> Hermaphrodites, or monoecious species, have both the male and female parts on one organism. Most angiosperms do this and some gymnosperms. Technically, hermaphrodites have them on the same flower and monoecious just have them on the same plant, but yeah. Hermaphroditism comes with some benefits. Basically, with double the organs, you double your potential reproductive success, and you can mate with 100% of the population. And if you can't find a suitable mate, you could impregnate yourself. A lot of other species have something similar called parthenogenesis. In haplodiploid species, unfertilized eggs always become males, and in other species, the cells either recombine or never split up. Self-impregnation is better than nothing, but not good. Your sperm will have 50% of your DNA, and your eggs will have a different 50%, so you have 25% overlap, and that's really bad in terms of birth defects. It's thought that biological sex evolves specifically to prevent this. Also, from a pragmatic approach, what's the point of going through the whole song and dance of meiosis and gametes and fertilization if you're just going to end up with an objectively worse version of asexual reproduction? Hang on a minute. If seven different clades are all clamoring for haplodiploidy just for 75%, how come we aren't all going for 100%? Why did we even choose 50% in the first place? Well, that's a good question. For one thing, with two parents, you can probably pool enough resources to produce more offspring on average, so you're not losing an entire half. Another reason people like to pull up is that sexual reproduction increases diversity, but diversity isn't necessarily a good thing. Wait, don't clip that. Let's do the anemia malaria example. Let's say you have the genotype capital B, capital B. That means you have sickle cell anemia, but if you have capital B, lowercase b, you still have enough working cells to be safe from anemia, but they aren't strong enough to nurture malaria. You have resistance to malaria. Unfortunately, if you have lowercase b, lowercase b, malaria grows strong on your cells and you're just as vulnerable. In an ideal world, we'd all be safe from anemia and resistant to malaria, and if we were all asexual, that ratio would be preserved from one generation to the next to the next to the next, but we're not asexual. So we have to redistribute everything through a Punnett square. It resets us to Harvey Weinstein to Hardy Weinberg equilibrium with malaria and sickle cell anemia. So what's the advantage of sex? Well, imagine this board represents the 
ideal genome for survival. Asexual species keep their feet planted, firmly, in the middle of the board. Sexuals are hopping around, tap dancing from generation to generation, and yes, sometimes they fall off. But what happens when the board shifts? If you're staying on your toes, staying active, you have a better chance of keeping your footing when the environment you live in changes, and it's constantly changing, not to mention that you're not alone on the board. There's other species there, and sometimes they need to push you off to survive. If they're asexual, then you need to be asexual to keep up with them. This is called the Red Queen Theory, when you and a partner get locked in an arms race and neither of you can back out. Plus, if the example isn't as clear-cut as sickle cell anemia, then you're just losing out on free diversity. So how do asexuals thrive? Well. Life isn't always as chaotic as it is with mammals on land. Sometimes the board just gently sways and there's no partner to do the Red Queen with. Plus, you don't have to worry about finding a mate. So, no sex is alright in some conditions. One sex is okay, but not ideal. Two sexes is the industry standard, but now it's time to go above and beyond. Brace yourself. We'll skip three and jump straight to 28,000. Now, once you break two, increasing the number doesn't actually change the process, but Schizophilum commune has the most, so it's the most studied. Also, it's a really widespread species. Probably because the more sexes you have, the better the process functions. So, what is the process? Well, pushing beyond three is difficult because you're not creating an alternative to male or female, it's just different types of those two. For the sake of clarity, I'll start the example with three sexes and then we'll work our way up. Fungi don't really have typical males and females, they don't even have sex organs, so I'll refer to the three sexes using the letters Fech, Ur, and Thorn. Because the Germanics can do science just as well as the Greeks. If you're a Fech, that means you can reproduce with either an Ur or a Thorn. So your potential matches go up from 50% to 67%. If we introduce three more sexes, Os, Rada, and Chen, you can reproduce with 83% of the population. And here's the really genius part. If you're a Fech, that means one of your parents was also a Fech, and they passed that gene on to you. Statistically, they also passed that gene on to 50% of your siblings. This continues to be true no matter how many possibilities you add. You will only ever be able to reproduce with 50% of your siblings. Incest looks like you're outcest. That was bad, but this is all going off the assumption that this single point controls sex. What if there were two? Oh ho ho! Here the notation is going to get complicated, so I'll use runic letters for the red gene and Greek letters for the blue gene, and now you count all possible combinations and the number starts to grow real fast. Let's make a new fungus with the genotype Wyn Kappa. If another fungus has either a Wyn, a 1 out of 8 possibility, or a Kappa, a 1 out of 10 possibility, you can't reproduce with them. All in all, that gives you a whopping 78.75% of the population to reproduce with, but within your siblings, your parents only have a pool of four, and we know two of those are Wyn and Gappa. So to reproduce with you, your siblings would have to dodge inheriting either the Wyn or the Gappa, leaving them with only one option, a 25% chance. This number is controlled by the number of points, but the 78.75% is with 10 Greek letters and 8 Norse runes. Those split gill mushrooms I was talking about? They have close to 100 Greek letters and 300 Norse runes. That gives their incest hit rate at the same dismal 25%, but outside the family, you can reproduce with 98.6% of the population. In a similar but unrelated boat, this weird worm, this time we're using worm to refer to nematodes, that was discovered in a volcanic lake has three sexes, male, female, and hermaphrodite. This is uncommon but not unheard of. The hermaphrodite is slotted in as an edge case, where specific conditions like scarcity of potential mates make the mother produce hermaphrodites. And sometimes the environmental conditions determine gonads, but they also have the mushroom system, so a male part needs to mate with a female part, and the mating types have to be different. So, how many sexes are there in all? Well, I would argue this serves as a perfect example of why there's only three. Sex refers to the exact biological hardware. The runes, which refer to something called mating group, are weirdly kind of similar to human gender. They're not connected to the gonads, they just happen to determine who can reproduce with whom. And sex should only refer to your gonads. Mating group is just an extra but ultimately unrelated variable. So, in the end, there's only two sexes. The one I had with your mother, and the one I have with the split gill